Today on CityCast Portland, we're talking about the dramatic sudden fall of the Oregon Secretary of State, Shamia Fagan, plus the no-show shenanigans that stopped work at the state legislature this week. Joining me for our weekly news roundup is the reporter who broke the news of the Fagan scandal, Willamette Week's Sophie Peel, plus our very own audio producer, Julia Fiaioni. It's Friday, May 5th. I'm John Natariani, in for Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Well, Julia, Sophie, thanks so much for coming on the roundtable. It's good to see you two. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So before we get into it for real, I always like to start off with a little question to sort of get a sense of everybody who's sitting around the table today. And I think all of us have had a pretty big week. Sophie, you've definitely been really busy over the last seven days. So I want to ask you guys, in what's your place in Portland that is your relaxation spot? And I'll start it off so you guys can think about it for a minute, especially on the kind of rainy day like today. I'm a real loyally guy. I love to get in, take a sauna, sweat it out for a little while, take a cold shower, drink some tea, sit in a bathrobe, read a book. I feel like <laughs> two hours of that and I am just completely relaxed and ready to go. What about you guys? I clean. You clean. <laughs> Sounds so lame, but I'm a busy body. And so I, I have a very hard time not doing much. So usually my Saturday and Sunday mornings is I get up, I make a cup of coffee, and then I, I just clean <laughs> until there's nothing left to clean. <laughs> Sophie's house is spotless. <laughs> it, it is. I will say that it is. That's one of my redeeming qualities. <laughs> is this like a deep dive clean? Are you like getting like way into it? Or is it just sort of like a constant tidying? It's, it's a constant tidying. Like I'll shift things, you know, two inches and then go back. And I don't know, maybe it's OCD now that I think about it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say it's the deepest clean. It's just I, I just have to move. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have like an after cleaning activity that's more restful than the actual cleaning? Or is that it? <laughs> no, that's my that's my chill time. <laughs> that really is, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. When I think about the times I've deep cleaned my house, there's always something to look forward to after, whether mm. that's like a drink or hanging out with a friend. Um, but for myself, I think the thing for me in Portland is usually going to the the Powell's on Burnside mm. in mm. Northwest. Even though it's not very restful at all, it's it's a pretty chaotic environment. I think the the buzz of that kind of conversation. And the excitement in the air on a weekend feels very comforting for me to just sit and grab a book um, off of one of the shelves and have a coffee and and take my time and look at people walking down the street through the window. It's it's always been a a peaceful place for me. Mm. Do you have a color? Like, you know, Powell's is all color coded according to (laughs) genre of book. What's your what's your color? Do you know? I don't have a color. That's so fair. You know, I usually, when I'm looking for more restful reading, I go towards poetry and prose. I think that's blue. <laughs> I think it's blue because that's where I go too. You go in the front door yeah. and it's right to the left. Yeah, that's uh-huh. my genre Yeah, no, too. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Well, I guess we're ready to get into it. We've got, uh, normally we'll do three topics of stories that caught our eyes each week, but This week was such a big news week. We're just doing two topics. And uh, Sophie, this is one that you basically were the main reporter that broke. Um, So I'm going to ask you to sort of get us into just what happened (laughs) with the Secretary of State today. And I know that this is a long story that, you know, we could probably spend the entire time just having you tell us this story. So let me like set you up a little bit. You were looking into this company called Lamoda. Um, And you found out that there were some ties to Secretary of State Shamia Fagan. So, like, let's take it from there. What did you discover and what happened? Yeah, so I think we published our initial story in late March, which really, I mean, the focus was on this this dispensary chain, LaModa. They've got quite a few financial and legal troubles. They've been issued over $7 million in federal and state tax liens. They've been sued 30 times in Oregon Circuit Courts. Many of those complaints allege non-payment of bills. Um, And, you know, over the past 
three-ish years, they've really climbed the ranks of political influence in the Democratic Party. They're big donors. They were big donors to uh, Governor Tina Kotek. They're big donors to Shamia Fagan. I mean, they were they were just sort of everywhere. They were kind of ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, and they're they're a young couple. You know, Rose is thirty four, and Aaron Mitchell is forty five. Um, and so they, I think they sort of had the cool factor as well. You know, the first kind of document that we have tying them together is, I think, a, I think it was a September 2020 donation. So after she started, you know, after she decided to run for secretary of state. So anyways, fast forward a month. Um, last week, we received a tip on Wednesday morning from a burner email, still no clue who it was, who basically said, hey, we think you should ask some questions about this. And I was like, this is, nah, this isn't, I didn't even tell my editor for like 12 hours because I didn't want to get his hopes up. <laughs> I mean, did you think it was crap? Did you think it was nothing when it came, when that email showed up? It was too specific mm -hmm. to not be not at all true. I mean, it was like, mm. on one hand, I was like, this is, this is too bizarre. This didn't happen. But on the other hand, I was like, this is a weird tip for someone to make up. And what was, and what was that specific tip, just in case anybody missed it? We heard there was a contract. Mm -hmm. Shamia had decided to or had agreed to do some work for Lamoda. Mm -hmm. um, so we mm -hmm. sent questions off to their office. And, you know, the next day that afternoon, we received word back from um, her office that basically said, yes, she entered into a contract with a Lamoda, Lamoda affiliate company called Variate. I'm not sure how to pronounce that Variate Holding. Um, which is one of many, many, I mean, over a hundred LLCs that Rosa Casares and Aaron Mitchell control. So again, one of many of their companies, but mm -hmm. she had entered a contract with them in February. And to do so, she had recused herself from an audit of the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission, which as many people know, is the state agency that regulates cannabis, including Lamoda. And Lamoda is the second largest dispensary chain in the state. So, you know, they're a big part of what the OLCC is supposed to, in theory, supposed to regulate. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, Secretary Fagan had had basically, I mean, this is a, har a little harsher way of saying it, but I, I feel confident in this, you know, she had abdicated her duties, basically, one of the main functions that she was elected by Oregonians to fulfill, which is to keep, you know, agencies on task and make sure that they're using their resources responsibly. She had let that go in favor for a pretty lucrative contract. She was yeah. getting paid $10,000 a month and then was also being offered $30,000 um, bonus for every cannabis license that was obtained outside of Oregon and New Mexico. Yeah, yeah. And so you reached out on that Wednesday. Wednesday. You heard back from Thursday the 27th from them confirming that this was the case. Mm -hmm. She resigned then this Tuesday. <laughs> like just a couple days later. Yeah, I mean, it, it was really, the trajectory was really interesting. I mean, her, she and her office were not forthcoming about what was in that contract. You know, she refused to hand over that contract until Monday morning. So she waited mm -hmm. Thursday, Friday, and then through the weekend to release it. And I think for, I think that made a lot of people in her very own party turn against her because, you know, she's, she was elected right as Donald Trump was, you know, spewing lies about election denialism, you know, all that. And mm -hmm. so the secretary of state, which was sort of a, a, a boring job that didn't mean all that much. I mean, it, yeah. it did, but not in the public eye. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was kind of catapulted into into the spotlight of this is our mm -hmm. like chief transparency officer. This is the person in the state that is supposed to honor accountability and transparency and truthfulness. And so that anyway, she she finally handed that contract over on Monday morning during a, a press conference. Mm -hmm. um, and then the following morning, she she resigned. So it escalated quickly. I think there's still, you know, so many questions about their relationship, her relationship with Rosa and Aaron. I think there's still so many questions about whether there were ethics violations. Governor yeah. Kotek has asked for a double investigation, one by the Oregon Department of Justice into the audit and whether it was influenced by that relationship, which mm -hmm. preliminary documentation that we and others received would suggest that there probably was influence. So there's documentation dating back to early January 2021 that shows Fagan had pressed her auditing staff to interview Rosa about Rosa Casares, who's one of Lamoda's owners, about her concerns about the OLCC. So there was, you know, some influence. And then um, Governor Kotek, the other investigation she had asked for uh, was from the Oregon Government Ethics Commission to see if, you know, Fagan had violated any ethics laws in taking that contract. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, mm. there's just so much here, and I have 4,000 questions I want to ask you about <laughs> this. But Julia, I also want to get you in. We've been talking about it a lot this week. What jumps out at you about this story, and what questions do you still have? Oh, yeah. So um, as some listeners may know, I am newer to Portland. I moved here about a year and a half ago. Um, so Fagan's reputation as this rising star as she was is quite new to me. So I don't think I really understood the significance of um, her fall from fame until recently in, in reading some of Sophie's articles. And this line stood out most to me in something that Sophie wrote uh, in her recent article published on May 3rd, Up in Smoke. And it was, people watched in shock as the career of a once rising star of the Democratic Party took on the trajectory of a SpaceX rocket, which I think is just fabulously written. <laughs> And it killed me. And I was like, I, I cannot take credit for the SpaceX rocket. I wanted to cut that. <laughs> <laughs> that was my See, colleague, Nigel. Um, it's, it's quite vivid. Yeah. So yes, I cannot, I cannot take credit for the SpaceX <laughs> rocket analogy. <laughs> so shout out Nigel is what I'm hearing. But <laughs> Shout um, out Nigel. And, you know, Nigel was also took down another major Oregon political figure a couple years ago <laughs> when Governor John Kitzhaber resigned in 2015. That was... Also, Will Lamet Weeks reporting, right, Sophie? I saw that edit, and I was like, oh, my God, we cannot put that in there. But I guess people liked it. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But yeah. this is all to say I would love to hear uh, your thoughts on that trajectory and, and just uh, what that felt like, being someone that's a little bit more connected to it. There there are a couple things that made her stand out. One, she's she's young. You know, she's 41 now. She's, she's young. Two, she is born and raised in Oregon. And three, she really kind of bucked off some of the tropes that I think are usually attached to, you know, successful Democratic politicians. So she was born and raised in Oregon. You know, she says she grew up pretty poor. Her, you know, her mom went through bouts of addiction. And then her, you know, her, her brother and her dad were sometimes homeless. You know, she is, you know, if you want to talk about sort of a a pull yourself up by your bootstrap story, like Secretary Fagan is that. And she mm-hmm. had a really, you know, she had a strong reputation of not always voting along party lines, which I think we have a really, like, there are not many Democratic politicians in Oregon who can say that. Like, mm-hmm. we have got mm-hmm. a block. We do not have a ton of independent Democratic thinkers. And I think she was seen as one of those. Yeah, um, yeah. And she didn't have, like, a, an extensive track record of making really ambitious decisions or legislations, but she had a solid reputation um, you know, she had tattoos. Like she, she was just she that, a big vote tattoo on her forearm. Yeah, she was one of those politicians that, you know, you didn't look at her and like she bored you. I guess you know she wasn't a sixty-five-year-old white man, mm-hmm. and um, she was outspoken and she was sometimes unpolished in a really you know endearing way. So yeah, she you know she she was an up and comer for sure. It was no secret that she wanted to succeed you know, Senator Ron Wyden, and then one day maybe become governor after Mm -hmm. Governor Kotex. So she she had big political ambitions. And I think there were a lot of people that thought she could get there. Yeah, yeah. Although although I did look back and I remembered 2020 when she started running was when she really came on my radar. Uh, And your paper did endorse her in the in the general election. But you didn't endorse her in the primary. And one of the, I mean, the main thrust of the argument at that point was um, kind of about her coziness with unions uh, and some of the union funding that had gone into her campaign. But it, you know, the Willamette Week in, you know, May of 2020 raised questions about how she would govern. I mean, it's interesting to me to think that, like, we still, as far as we know, she hasn't done anything blanketly illegal, right? This is all about judgment. Right. This is all about character. This is all about like what the decisions that she made says about her sort of ethically as opposed to like legally or criminally, right? I mean, we have no, the Oregon Government Ethics Commission could come back and say, according to ethics laws in Oregon, she didn't break any laws. But, she, you know, Secretary Fagan actually made this distinction on Monday, and I'm going to butcher the quote, so this is not verbatim, but she said something like, I'm acknowledging here that there's a difference between you know, following all the rules and not breaking any rules and doing something like morally or ethically wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, Mm -hmm. I mean, she resigned because I think she acknowledges that she broke the trust of Oregonians in taking this contract. And especially like I, and this is my two cents and I don't think everyone agrees with me, but I think had she dealt with this differently, 
starting Thursday afternoon, she may mm. have survived this. Yeah. But the secrecy in which she sort of shrouded this contract in and her, you know, she she told reporters on Monday morning in response to questions, I think, from the Oregonian that she wasn't she wasn't going to release her tax returns. Mm -hmm. And I think that in of itself raised some questions. And then she she was just so untransparent about her relationship with these people and her contract with these people um, that it just it, it I think it really it made people very wary and even people her in her own party to back her up on this. I mean, pe everyone, all Democratic politicians that had received donations from Lamoda suddenly were giving them to charity, mm -hmm. you know, a month after we had initially reported a, about everything Lamoda. But of course, it wasn't until the Fagan scandal that they actually decided to do something with this money. Yeah, which yeah. I have some feelings about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are so many like next step questions that we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all sorts of speculation going on about who is going to fill the role. Uh, there's a bunch of questions about like, what this means for her law license. Um, but there are these two investigations that are going on. There's like an ethics probe, uh, and there's also a Department of Justice review of an audit that she did of the OLCC. Did these keep going on? And like, could- They do. Like, what, what do you think now that she's resigned? Like, what's the outcome of those investigations? All we know at this time is that they, they'll continue even though she's resigned. Both are really interesting in their own right. I mean, the the ethics commission investigation. You know, if 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 they do find that she violated ethics rules or laws in Oregon, she'll have to you know pay a, a fine out of her own pocket. And then the the investigation into the audit. I think I'm more I'm more interested in that one because mm -hmm. you know at least working papers that we received from the audit would suggest that Fagan you know, put her thumb on the direction of the audit and sort of twisted herself in, you know, strange positions in order to get Rosa's input into that audit. I mean, there were multiple times before the audit had even started that she was emailing the lead auditor and the director of audits, Kit Memet, and saying, you need to talk to Rosa Casares. And it wasn't really, hey, have you thought about this? It was, have you talked to Rosa yet? Please schedule mm. a time to talk with her. So we know Rosa had a lot of influence, but I'm yeah. I'm very curious to see what comes of that. Well, it's only fair. We already had a huge liquor scandal this year with the whole thing <laughs> where they were, state officials were keeping bottles of liquor for themselves. I think it's only fair that we have a cannabis scandal too. Right, we have one of each. One of each. <laughs> this, this has been a tough one. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I've got a lot more to say about this, but let's take a quick break. Julia, do you have a final take on this? Well, one thing I do want to touch on before um, we wrap up this headline is just talking about how much she was being paid. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty interesting that she was celebrated because of her pull herself up from her boot bootstraps background, where she didn't have a lot of financial stability. It's something that's followed her into adulthood. It, it was said that she had $135,000 in personal credit and tuition debt. And when it came down to her feeling financially strained enough to go and take on another job, it's now turned in this into this controversy. And I kind of just want to throw out the question there of if it's possible to be in a position like Fagan is Secretary of State and have like a fruitful financial life without feeling uh, the pressure to go and get a second job and and what that says about our our state government. Yeah, I saw some reporting in the Oregonian that says that we have the worst paid Secretary of State in the country, just like full stop. Our our pay for Secretary of State is in other, you know, statewide electeds are is just woefully low. I think everyone acknowledges that, you know, and I think that's something that perhaps this whole scandal will will maybe lead to some reforms. I think we can hope for that. Um I guess my my own like how I would caveat this and and I I you know our electeds need to get paid more. I mean that's just like non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. Um because it takes away this temptation. But I think in Fagan's situation there are other people she could have obtained work with. Mm. But she chose Lamoda, which one big political donors to her. Two, don't treat their workers well according to you know, over 20 bully complaints filed in the past three years. Three, don't pay their federal and state taxes in full. And, you know, it's in the other thing, too, is she did not take any outside employment until 
Lamoda and until she started with Willamette University just this spring. Mm -hmm. And I believe she could have found work with other people. And it sounded like she she didn't seek this work with Lamoda. Lamoda had come to her and said, hey, would you want to do this? So I guess, you know, yes, our elected officials need to make more money. But with Fagan, it just doesn't really the inconsistency. It's not like she was consistently searching for work for three years. You know, it wasn't until a political donor came along and said, hey, would you want to work for us that she took it? Yeah. So yeah. for me, I guess that dilutes like maybe she did this because of, you know, she needed more income. Looking back, Sophie, at the um, article from May of 2020, when your paper was thinking about the endorsement of Shamia Fagan, uh, one of the things that also came up was Fagan calling out the Republicans' walkout of the state Senate as a threat to democracy, which, funny, funny, <laughs> just happened are. again. <laughs> We're <laughs> right back there. Uh, the Senate, well, you know, the state House passed two big bills this week, one related to abortion and gender-affirming care, another one on gun safety laws. Um, so the bills go to the Senate. Democrats have a majority there. And uh, Republicans responded this week by not showing up. Only two Republican senators made it uh, to the floor. And, you know, for anybody who like hasn't been keeping an eye on this whole thing, when they don't show up, it denies a quorum, which basically stops the legislature from doing business. Um, and so this was a protest that allowed them to basically hold up any legislation from going through. And this is something that uh, state Republicans have done several times in the last couple years. But it's especially tricky this time because we just passed a law, voters approved a law, that is designed to stop this exact thing from happening. Um, but we're back here again. It happened on Wednesday. I mean, we're taping Thursday morning. We at this point don't know what's going to happen with the rest of the week in the legislature. Um, but it's another big show of politics at the state capitol. Um, what struck you guys about this story? What's interesting to me, and this is sort of a niche thing, but the law we passed allowed for up to 10 absences, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like that should be a lot lower because if, if Republicans <laughs> keep using this tool of walking out, if you know, they can walk out nine times in a yeah. year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think they would, but like that, that still allows a lot of leeway. I mean, we can, we see the damage done with one walkout. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, I know there were some intricacies to that. Like if you step out to take a phone call for 15 minutes, you know, it can, like things that maybe shouldn't count as an absence are counted as an absence in this bill. But, but I don't know, maybe we should have been more specific about the language around it. Mm -hmm. Um. It's just, it's frustrating. I also wonder if this is, this happens this often in other states or if this is sort of like an Oregon problem. And I mm -hmm. don't know the answer to that. You know, Oregon is just one of four states. It's Indiana, Tennessee, and Texas as well that has this law that two thirds of lawmakers have to be present in order to vote on bills, which I think is so interesting. But uh, to Sophie's point as well, I was thinking about Measure 113 that was passed last year that gives out these uh, punishments for being absent. And I think what's fascinating is that people are starting to speculate that uh, the GOP has found a, a workaround to this law where they're essentially rotating who's absent on what days in order to stay within that 10-day limit mm -hmm. and be able to delay the process as much as possible, which... Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, like, but when this has happened in years past, I feel like it's been such an explosive thing. Like a couple years ago, there was this walkout and Governor Brown like deputized state troopers to go and like find the lawmakers and track them down, you know? <laughs> and, and and then they're like, well, we're out of state, so you can't come get us. I mean, I, I feel like the the mind melting aspect of this is a little bit lower this time than it has been in the past because we do have this new law because, you know, Governor Kotex says she's not going to be sending deputies or state troopers to go and like track down these lawmakers. It feels so juvenile. It's like what a, like a six year old would do, you know, like on the playground, like go hide behind a tree. And <laughs> I mean, but I think it's interesting because we have seen a legislative session where Democrats have been pushing a ton of stuff through and a ton of laws that really could change a lot of situations for people in Oregon, you know, massive housing bill, um, some like really big legislation. And the the two bills that 
the Republicans really took a stand on are these culture bills, right? One about mm -hmm. gun control and then about abortion and, um, you know, gender affirming care. So they've really focused on some of these like really hot button cultural issues to take the stand and walk out of the legislature, which feels like it mirrors what's going on in politics mm -hmm. nationally, too. I'm wondering now, too, is that um, I guess this question's come to mind um, is whether or not over the past few years, the overall power and potential of a supermajority have changed because of these walkouts and these stall tactics where it's just it doesn't lead to as much of a success story as it used to. I, I don't know. I mean, we have less of a majority than we did a few years prior, right? Like, I think that we had had a supermajority in both chambers of the House. I think we just have a simple majority in the Senate now. But like what the Republicans are always eager to sort of throw back is that Democrats did it too, that this is something that... You know, 20 years ago, uh, Democrats in the Oregon legislature also sort of staged a walkout. And that was about, I think, political redistricting. So I don't know. I mean, I think that this is one of those sort of political tools that doesn't help anyone, that mm -hmm. whether or not you agree with laws or don't agree with laws, having the ability to just shut down legislating and stop the government from functioning is a bad thing no matter what. And it's a tool that like Republicans shouldn't have. And it's a tool that Democrats shouldn't have. It's just mm -hmm. bad for everybody. Yeah. And John, to your point about Democrats also having done it before, I was reading this this Vox article, and back in February of 2020, it, it had said that Oregon Republicans have walked out more times in the past 10 months than all Democrats have in modern history. Mm -hmm. So the comparison of, oh, well, they did it too, is falls kind of flat when you look at the amount of times that have that each side has done it. Mm -hmm. I think the bummer is, like, I don't think this is going to change without, like, an external push you know like i don't think this is going to change without laws and without new legislation mm -hmm. um you know this is the tool that they've wielded now for a couple couple years and they've you know they keep finding kind of loopholes to to sneak through in order to hold up legislation and i just i i don't see the republican party like having a rebirth is not the right word but like a come to jesus moment where they don't use these tactics anymore mm -hmm. at least not in our current political climate and i don't think that's about to change and I, I wonder, too, um, if bills are now being written with these stalled tactics in mind. For example, like simpler language, shorter texts, smaller asks, just to get them through. There is a whole component of this that the, the Republicans have launched a lawsuit as well, in addition to this walkout, because there is a provision <laughs> that bills need to be written in plain language. And they're saying that the you know abortion bill in particular is, is written too complexly, and they're asking a judge to throw it out by saying that the language of the bill is too complex and, and therefore <laughs> should not allow it to be a law, um, which I don't know. I'd love to get some eighth graders on the show and have them read different <laughs> legislative packages and see what they what sense they can make of them. I think that there's very few <laughs> bills that are being passed today that your average eighth grader would be able to be like, oh, yeah, I understand this completely. Mm hmm. Uh, well, we will see. Sophie, Julia, uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, that's it for us this week here on CityCast Portland. I'm the show's lead producer, John Natariani. Our audio producer is Julia Fiaioni. Our newsletter editor is Rachel Monahan, And our host is the incredible Claudia Meza. Claudia, hope you're having a great vacation. Huge, huge thanks to Lizzie Goldsmith and Natalie Rivera, who helped us put the show together this week. Original music by Jenny Conley and Stephen Drisos. Additional music by Epidemic Sound. We'll be back Monday morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. Slim's.